Every universe is different, each one just a fraction unique. Thus, the Infinity Stones are unique. Welcome back, everyone. It's Charlie. This will be my full Marvel What If Episode 9 finale video. There's a whole bunch of Easter eggs and setup for What If Season 2, so we'll break it all down. If you're brand new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to get everything. I will be doing videos for Hawkeye episodes. That's going to be the next Marvel Disney Plus series that'll start really soon. Careful for spoilers if you have not seen the episode yet because we'll be talking about everything. We'll just start at the beginning and go through shot by shot talking about Easter eggs, WTF moments, starting with the episode title, What If the Watcher Broke His Oath? That's a reference to the Watcher's oath to not interfere in the affairs of lesser beings. He's talked about it in every single episode. The whole reason why the Watcher took this oath in the first place is he actually took it as a sort of penance. A long time ago in the history of the Watcher's race, they actually did use their cosmic abilities to interfere with the affairs of a planet to try and help them, but it wound up leading to the destruction of that race of people. The punishment they wound up levying on themselves was to watch the universe unfold, watch time unfold, and no longer interfering. But if you've ever read any Marvel comics, you see that the Watcher talks to the Avengers all the time. We do have live action MCU Watchers that we've seen in Guardians of the Galaxy 2. Stan Lee's character is literally an agent of the Watchers, so I think it's only a matter of time before we see live action MCU characters actually talking to a live action version of Uatu. Hopefully they'll also find a way for Jeffrey Wright to play that version of Uatu in the MCU as well. But the actual episode starts with a version of the Captain America Winter Soldier movie plot with Peggy Carter's Captain Carter in the present day of her universe. She's got the same stealth version of her suit, just like Captain America did in the movie. They're going after the same ship in the movie, being held hostage by Batroke the Leaper, who did come back from the movies to play his character. That was actually one of the brand new movie actors that came back. All the other movie actors like Chadwick Boseman coming back as T'Challa Star-Lord, Benedict Cumberbatch coming back as Dark Doctor Strange, they were in previous episodes. Most of the characters in this final episode were being played by the movie versions of the characters, with a few exceptions. This time, though, they have a couple twists on the jokes at the beginning of the movie, a couple of the references they make, like this version of Black Widow tries to set up Captain Carter with Bernard from accounting instead of the woman Lillian from accounting that she was trying to set Captain America up with. She then mentions the name Steve, talking about her version of Steve Rogers, and Peggy jokingly acts like she's wounded to her core, like, ouch, that hurt. This whole boarding scene with her taking out all the guards plays out exactly the same as it did during the movie. The episode is a little bit longer than normal, but it's still a relatively short episode, so they kind of have to blow through some of these plot moments. Instead of taking Batroke down using his own fighting style, the Watcher stops their fight short to recruit her, then goes around to all the different universes that we saw in the different episodes to recruit the main characters. Stopping next on T'Challa Star-Lord's Earth, who's in the middle of saving his version of Peter Quill from Ego the Living Planet with his version of the Guardians of the Galaxy and the Ravagers. So you kind of see that in each of the episodes when he goes around recruiting people, and then even at the end of the episode when he sends them all back, they kind of tell you what happened after the end of each of the different episodes. Because all the episodes kind of ended on WTF cliffhangers. Like, uh, R.I.P. this universe. Most of the characters got happy endings, even though they didn't save every single universe. Then this is actually really cool, this whole Gamora Iron Man scene. This is actually a look at the missing episode with Iron Man and Gamora where they got sent to Sakaar instead of the Hulk and Thor. If you didn't see my earlier video where I explained what happened to this episode, there were supposed to be 10 episodes of What If Season 1. The reason why there's only 9 is because they ran its delays because of the virus with production issues, so they implied that one of the episodes got pushed to Season 2. So maybe they'll follow up with this version of Gamora and Iron Man during Season 2. We'll see. So this version of Gamora is wearing Thanos' armor and has his giant double-bladed sword. This version of Iron Man has a version of the Hulk Buster that he's created from the leftover trash on Sakaar. So call it the Trash Buster armor. They're currently on Nidavellir, the dwarven homeworld where Eitri is in the middle of melting down their universe's version of the Infinity Gauntlet, them having just destroyed their version of the Infinity Stones. Iron Man makes the exact same Avengers Age of Ultron reference, wrapping the world in a suit of armor. The closest reference I could make to that, like a giant cosmic Iron Man armor suit, would be like the God Killer armor, which is actually an Iron Man suit of armor that was built by the Dark Celestials, the Aspirants. Maybe they'll do that in What If. That feels like a very animated thing to do, because I don't think we'll ever see it in live action. But in this quick scene of them, they basically recap the events of their episode. And then the Watcher shows up to recruit Gamora and provide some more context for what happened. This Gamora is still a hero. She's still a good character. She hasn't gone bad. She took Thanos' armor from him when she defeated him with Iron Man's help and when they took the Infinity Gauntlet from him. 
When Iron Man makes fun of the Watcher saying he's going to kick his moon-shaped ugly face, that's a reference to Avengers Infinity War where Peter Quill was making fun of Thanos' face, calling him a purple space grimace with a nutsack chin. But basically, this whole scene is meant to be a very Avengers Infinity War kind of scene, like Thor going to get Stormbreaker, except they're going to get the Infinity Gauntlet melted down because each remade the Infinity Gauntlet. And even though they don't reveal it till later, it's also kind of implied that Iron Man is the person who built the Infinity Crusher device in this universe, the device that they use to atomize their version of the Infinity Stones. I did think it was kind of weird that they only wanted Gamora for the Guardians of the Multiverse team. Like, wouldn't you also want Iron Man? It feels like a pretty good person to add to the team. This Iron Man also has the distinction of being the only Iron Man that they did not kill in an episode. Then the Watcher goes to Killmonger Black Panther's Earth to recruit him, and they show what happened after the end of his episode, Pepper Potts and Shuri having teamed up with Adore Milaje, who also learned the truth about what he did killing both Iron Man and his version of T'Challa. So the Watcher coming to yoink him is actually kind of a blessing in disguise, offering him a way to escape justice in his own universe. And obviously, based on the ending of the episode, he's not coming back to this universe anytime soon. Then he goes to Party Thor's universe, who's in the middle of fighting all the sub-Ultron robots, and they play it for a funny moment with him just taking a hot second to catch on to what's what. He brings all the characters to this special extra-dimensional space conjured by Dark Doctor Strange to make them feel more comfortable, but this space where they are is kind of like a pocket dimension outside the normal multiverse. That's also meant to be foreshadowing for the big twist at the end, too, with the version of Killmonger and the version of Arnim Zola Ultron that get trapped in yet another pocket dimension. But Doctor Strange explains that he built it to look like this from Captain Carter's memories just to make everyone feel a little more at home, making it look like the English pub where she and Steve Rogers had their final drink together before that last mission in episode one. This is also meant to foreshadow the mid credit scene of the Winter Soldier version of the Hydra Stomper Steve Rogers. He gives Party Thor another one of those never-ending magical beers like he did during the Doctor Strange post credit scene and in Thor Ragnarok. And if you remember, they also had the never-ending magical beers during the Party Thor episode as well. I love the little joke that they gave Chadwick Boseman here too. His T'Challa Star-Lord makes fun of the Watcher when he shows up again out of nowhere. Like, come on, man, get a new trick. They set up the whole Killmonger Black Panther subplot with him clocking the Ultron robot head, starting to get the idea about the Infinity Stones. And when the Watcher's explaining everything to them, he mentions Eternity, the living embodiment of the multiverse. He says that he was searching all of Eternity for one true hero, but then got the better idea to pull the best from each universe, or the ones that he felt like were necessary. Because let's be honest, if the multiverse is supposed to be theoretically infinite, if he pulled the best hero from every universe, there would be like a billion people on this team. And then he gives them the actual Guardians of the Multiverse team name. So the idea is that even though the roster of the Guardians of the Multiverse team will change season to season, the team itself will continue throughout the series however many seasons it runs. Doctor Strange and the Watcher give them all the same PowerPoint presentation that they gave Iron Man at the beginning of Avengers Infinity War about the history of the Infinity Stones. We'll also get a little bit of this backstory more context during the Eternals movie as well because they'll be telling the cosmic origin of the MCU in a way that they did not do during the Loki series. They have the funny moment with the multiverse Chinese delivery because Party Thor gets super hungry, so you just see them all eating Chinese that Doctor Strange brings them from across the multiverse. The multiverse's finest Chinese restaurant. Gamora explains her Infinity Crusher device, even though it winds up not working later in the episode. There's a lot of logic issues that they run into. I'll address that when we get to that part of the episode. But they basically imply that Iron Man built this device in their universe and they used it to atomize their version of the Infinity Stones. Because you can't destroy the Infinity Stones, but you can reduce them to practically nothingness. They travel to another version of Earth in a universe where there's not enough intelligent life to be a target of interest for Ultron until they start attracting attention for themselves, just giving them time to prepare for their fight. When Doctor Strange tries to do that really awkward, funny toast, and he says another wise sorcerer told him this lesson, he's just referring to himself, like he is the wise sorcerer that said this before. Then they actually start their big fights against Ultron who shows up, and each of the fights is kind of progressive, like getting more and more complex as they going on, with more and more combo moves of the multiverse Avengers working together. That's really one of the best things about Avengers movies, is seeing different super powerful characters try to combine their powers and do something different with them. When Doctor Strange gives them all their magical armor power-ups, saying it's non-compliant magic, what he means is they're dangerous spells that his good half might not normally have tried. 
You also notice, too, that even though the armor is meant to be invisible, while it's still forming around them, each different suit bears characteristics from each of the characters' cultures. Like, Captain Carter's armor looks kind of like a medieval British suit of armor because she's British. Both Killmonger and T'Challa Star-Lord's armor looks kind of Wakandan-inspired. Party Thor's magical armor looks kind of Asgardian-inspired. I believe Killmonger's line here, see you on the flip side, is also a line that he quoted during the Black Panther movie. Party Thor references Viva Las Vegas, which is a pretty common catchphrase, trying to soak Ultron in lightning damage, unsuccessfully. It's kind of like the first Avengers movie when Thor tried to soak Iron Man with lightning damage. Then they start to show off some of the really cool Avengers combo moves. So Dark Doctor Strange creating many copies of Thor's hammer to use against Ultron. It'll be fun to see how they try to do stuff like this during Avengers 5 with all the brand new characters that are coming together. We're actually going to see some cool Avengers combo moves during Spider-Man No Way Home too because Spider-Man is getting a bunch of new suits. One of his black suits, for instance, is going to be used with Doctor Strange's magic. So it's already kind of like a combo move. But the next big combo fight move is Doctor Strange enhancing Captain Carter's shield strike, after which she grabs one of Thor's hammers. And even though she would be worthy, just based on the logic here, in Party Thor's universe, I don't think that his version of Odin ever put the worthiness enchantment on his hammer. So theoretically, anybody should be able to wield any of these hammers that are flying around here. But then next big combo is Doctor Strange causing all the hammers to strike Ultron simultaneously and Thor using his powers to cause them all to discharge a huge combo lightning blast at the same time, like a plus ultra lightning blast. T'Challa Star-Lord stealing the Soul Stone from Ultron is a reference to the Sticky Fingers twist from his episode, Episode 2, but it's also meant to be a reference to Iron Man stealing the Infinity Stones from Thanos in Avengers Endgame. There was also another reference to this when Killmonger yoinked all the Infinity Stones in the Infinity Armor at the end of the episode, too. Most of the big WTF moments from this episode were either Avengers Infinity War references or Avengers Endgame references, with a few exceptions, like all the Winter Soldier references. I was happy to see that they brought the Marvel Zombies back with a big twist. Doctor Strange basically just uses them to distract Ultron long enough for them to portal away, back to Ultron's original universe. Saying that yes, even though the zombies are really cool, the real reason why he brought them was because he wanted Zombie Scarlet Witch, who was way more powerful, even though their fight was also way shorter than I wanted it to be. Just another casualty of a really short episode, otherwise I think this fight scene would have gone on for way longer. Ultron basically shutting the fight down by destroying this entire planet. But the whole reason for them going back to Ultron's original universe to fight him there was because of the Arnim Zola AI that they were going to use to disable him. And when they do step through the portal, Black Widow immediately winds up yoinking the Soul Stone. When Captain Carter tries to win her over, form a connection with her, she mentions her da is Alexei. That's a reference to Alexei Shostakov, aka Red Guardian, David Harbour's character from Black Widow, and whose shield this version of Black Widow has been using since Episode 8. When Captain Carter mentions the three people in the universe Black Widow trusts, she's talking about herself, or in this universe, it would be Captain America Steve Rogers, Nick Fury, and then Hawkeye. They have their own version of a big hot potato scene with the Soul Stone, meant to be a callback to the Avengers Endgame scene with Iron Man's nano infinity gauntlet like Hawkeye and everyone else running around passing it from person to person, trying to play keep away from Thanos. I did love Ultron reacting to Doctor Strange eating his energy blast that was going to level the planet. Like he was going to blow this planet up again too, but Doctor Strange basically consumes all of this energy damage. Our next big combo team up move is Black Widow and Captain Carter using both of their shields to tag team Ultron, after which the whole team starts working together to tag team him. And this is obviously meant to be their version of the Avengers Infinity War scene on the Titan battle against Thanos. Then here's where we get a little crazy with the way they use the Infinity Stones on the series. So Ultron finally uses his Time Stone to slow everything down, but because Dark Doctor Strange still has his Eye of Agamotto in his Time Stone, he uses it to counter the effects. So this is where we start to get crazy with the logic of how the Infinity Stones work, which universe do they work in, and add to that later in the episode when they claim that the Infinity Crusher device won't work because all the Infinity Stones in each universe are meant to be a little bit different on the cosmic level. So I feel like when it comes to a lot of the logic with the Infinity Stones and how they work in this episode, there's a lot of hand waving going on and it's a really short episode. So they're like, okay, we want to blow through this plot. So it's all about expediency. It didn't take me out of the story too much. It didn't bother me that much because the whole idea is that they're not going to use this twist again during season two and they're not going to use this twist in the live action movies either. 
but there's a very important reason why you don't see a bunch of different versions of Infinity Stones being used against each other. Like, you don't want to have a situation with, like, ten different people with their own Infinity Gauntlets all going at each other in a scene, because it would just completely break the story. Cue the Deadpool scene of him yelling about lazy writing. Oh, that's just lazy writing. But then Doctor Strange unleashes his true magical power on him. And if you want to make a berserk manga or anime reference, this would be like Doctor Strange's true apostle form, where he goes into like true monstrous form. Then even though they're able to use the Infinity Crusher to steal the Infinity Stones from Ultron's body, like I said, the way they explain it per the logic of this episode, it only works on the Infinity Stones from its original universe. Don't drive yourself crazy trying to make too much sense of this. Then as Ultron is kind of laughing at them, explaining the Infinity Stones to them, they have their version of the Multiverse Avengers assemble moment. One of the most iconic Marvel movie scenes of all time, with them spinning the camera around the whole team, just like the Avengers movie. Then they finally bring back the Arnim Zola AI and use it to disable Ultron long enough for them to yoink the Infinity Stones back. With a big twist, obviously, because of what Killmonger is doing. I did like their dueling AI scene with the Zola AI and Ultron yelling at each other inside his body. There's a big Easter egg here too for Arnim Zola's new body. When he talks about missing having a pair of legs, it's a reference to him putting himself in a robot body just like the classic comics. That's what Party Thor is referencing when he mentions the stomach face. And like that's literally right out of the comics. Then obviously big WTF moment, Killmonger uses his reprogrammed Ultron head and vibranium nanotech to basically do the exact same thing Iron Man did in Avengers Endgame, stealing the Infinity Stones, except it's more like stealing the Infinity Armor. Which is also a big comic book twist they pulled recently. Even though he kind of goes off the rails, he's not completely evil, like you're meant to understand his perspective, like, oh, I get it, I get where he's coming from. Killmonger's idea is to use these Infinity Stones to restore each of the different versions of Earth in the different universes, which is a very on-brand thing for Killmonger to want to do. But again, like I said, this only gets more complicated with the logic of how the Infinity Stones work, who can use them in alternate universes, should they work in alternate universes. The way they dodge dealing with this problem is by having that big pocket dimension twist at the end. Another really cool easter egg you probably noticed here too, when Killmonger activates the power of the Infinity Stones, he gives off that giant burst of energy. This is a huge easter egg for Dragon Ball Z, Dragon Ball Super Saiyan transformations. If you didn't realize it, Killmonger in the MCU was designed to look like Vegeta. They talk about it a lot in the behind the scenes on Black Panther. That's why his vest armor looks a lot like Vegeta's armor. Also, Killmonger's character in the Black Panther movie in the MCU, his backstory is meant to feel similar to Vegeta's backstory in the Dragon Ball anime. So if it wasn't totally clear here, when they're playing their cosmic tug of war with the Infinity Stones, this is actually Arnim Zola controlling Ultron Vision's body trying to steal the stones. Then Doctor Strange comes to that realization that they were never meant to kill Ultron, they were never supposed to, they were just meant to contain the problem, they were never meant to completely solve it. They just needed to separate the Infinity Stones from Ultron's body. So that's why he traps them in the pocket dimension. And because he's still dead set on punishing himself for foobarring his own universe, Dark Doctor Strange makes it his penance to watch over this pocket dimension for the rest of his life. So it's just another reference back to the Watcher's mission, like it's his job to basically watch the multiverse. It is now Dark Doctor Strange's job to watch the pocket dimension. Also, the funny thing here you may have noticed is when they go back to his special little base here that he created this pocket dimension, the Infinity Stones are now inside a pocket dimension within a pocket dimension, like a Russian nesting doll of dimensions. The Watcher sends everybody back to their original universes at the exact moment that they left, just claiming that they'll be the only ones who remembered what happened during this adventure. There's a big easter egg for Avengers Endgame when Captain Carter asks him to send her back to 1942 to give her the same happy ending scene that MCU Captain America got when he went back to live with his Peggy Carter. They do wind up paying that off with a huge Winter Soldier Hydra Stomper twist though in present day. This Black Widow's universe has been completely destroyed so the Watcher does do her a solid and send her to the other version of Earth where Loki conquered the world during episode 3. We also see what happened after the end of that episode as well, too. They had just activated Captain Marvel's pager and were about to unthaw Steve Rogers' Captain America from the ice. So he's dropping her off mid-fight where their new Avengers team and Nick Fury are battling Loki in their own version of the Battle of New York. It's just happening on the S.H.I.E.L.D. helicarrier. After which she uses the Mind Stone to pacify Loki. They imply that T'Challa Star-Lord and his version of Peter Quill eventually defeated Ego the Living Planet, saving their universe, so... Pretty much everybody here gets a happy ending of sorts. 
Gamora goes back to her version of Iron Man, Party Thor reunites with Jane Foster, and then the Watcher's whole ending speech here is about him taking a new, different vow to not only continue watching the multiverse, but also on top of that now doing everything in his power to actively protect it. Then in the mid credit scene, Captain Carter lands back mid-fight with Batroke and is helped by her original Black Widow who stuns him using her Widow Sting, and then they have this whole big Winter Soldier reveal that the villains on the boat had been after the Hydra Stomper armor, and it's implied that skinny boy Steve Rogers got a very Winter Soldier-like story after the end of episode 1, where he survived a present day through science like cryo-freezing, and the Hydra Stomper armor here you'll also notice is a much more advanced, much more modernized version of the armor than the original Hydra Stomper armor from episode 1. With all this tech all lit up around him, and it's inside this special containment cell, like it's literally a prison cell of a box kind of implying that Hydra at some point got their hands on him and turned him into a mech version of the Winter Soldier, and maybe they'll just cover that story during season two. They did say that Captain Carter will definitely be back in future episodes, so I feel like they probably should have had one of those taglines in the credits where it reads, Thanos will return, like at the end of Avengers Infinity War, like Captain Carter will return. I'll do a longer video for this mid credit scene and more what if season two stuff tomorrow. But if you spotted any other big Easter eggs during the episode that I didn't talk about during the video, just write them below in the comments. All the Hawkeye episodes are going to be starting really soon, so I'll be doing videos for that. Make sure you have alerts enabled for my channel so you don't miss any of those. And there was a brand new Eternals trailer video that just posted, so I'll do a video for that as well too. Everyone click here for my new Marvel Daredevil Returns announcement breakdown, and click here for that brand new House of the Dragon trailer and Game of Thrones Easter eggs. Thank you so much for watching, everyone stay safe, and I'll see you guys in the next one.